Welcome to the Andy Staples Show. We are zeroing in on the Michigan Wolverines who just finished spring practice. Austin Meek, our Michigan beat writer, has had no breaks. No breaks whatsoever. He covered a Big Ten title. He covered a playoff run. He covered Jim Harbaugh. Maybe or maybe not going to the Minnesota Vikings. He then covered a basketball team that had Juwan Howard in a handshake line. Austin, did you take a big deep breath Sunday after the spring game? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, and like there is no off season uh, in in this sport. It was it was a whirlwind. Uh, I was in uh, Indianapolis, and then I was in San Antonio, and then I was back here for the for the spring game. But you know what? It's what we do, man. I love it. It's it's been fun. So this has been just a weird last few months for the way. I, probably a weird last fifteen months for Michigan because they they come off the terrible pandemic season. Jim Harbaugh gets his pay cut. They go win the Big Ten. They kick Ohio State's ass. They go to the playoff. Then Harbaugh decides, okay, now's my chance to get back to the NFL. He goes and interviews. The assumption is if he's offered the job, he's taking it. He doesn't get offered the job. He's back at Michigan now. But the staff has now had to be completely reconstructed because obviously everything that went well, a lot of those guys got rewarded for. Where are they right now? as they close spring football, does it, does it feel like this is a team coming off the big 10 title due for bigger things? Or does it feel like this is a, a, almost a reboot? You know, for as dramatic as that month of January was when Jim Harbaugh was openly exploring a return to the NFL, it really feels like things just went right back to the way they were, Um, which, which I kind of expected for, you know, for all the, angst in the fan base and all the people who were upset about the way that whole situation went down at that spring game on Saturday, watching Jim Harbaugh standing there in the backfield, you know, where he always is, you know, looking over the quarterback's shoulder. It just felt like it it was right back to normal. Like this is Michigan football. It's Jim Harbaugh's program. uh, You know, classic Jim Harbaugh. Um, you know, I, I think people really have have moved on from that, and the vibe now is is just the excitement of everything Michigan brings back from this team that won the Big Ten, that went to the playoff. Uh, I, I think by the time preseason camp gets here in August, Michigan fans are going to be as as excited as they've been at any point since Jim Harbaugh's arrival. This this looks like a really good team. They've they've got some holes to fill. They lost some pretty crucial players from last year's team, but really like the off season drama, like that's every year at Michigan. There's always something, yeah. there's always something with Jim Harbaugh, but somehow he finds a way when he needs to, uh, to get everybody locked in. And, and I think this is a really good team uh, that that's going to have a chance to pick up where last year's team left off. Well, and, and that's what's interesting to me is I think in a lot of programs, they couldn't just go right back to business as usual after that. But you, you and I were talking about this before we started recording. It's it's kind of the unique personalities in, in good and bad ways of, of Jim Harbaugh and of, of Ward Manuel, the, the AD there. And Harbaugh, we all know, is a, is a different cat. But he strikes me as the kind of person who, when he, decide, when he doesn't get offered the Vikings job, decides to go back to Michigan. And, and obviously, there are hurt feelings on both sides there because of his pay getting cut last year, because of you know, basically now he's coming back tail tucked between his legs, but that he can flip that switch. And this is my job. I will do my job and I will do it to the best of my ability. And then Ward Manuel, who I don't know very well. I probably talked to him two or three times strikes me as a very much adult in the room kind of guy. Like a lot of people would let this hurt their feelings, Mm -hmm. but he strikes me as one who's like, you know what? If Jim Harbaugh can come back and win another big 10 title, I'm good with this. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I you know when when the NFL stuff was going down, the the question people asked was, is this going to do long term damage to the relationship? Can Jim Harbaugh come back to Michigan after publicly exploring another job and basically making it known to everybody that if he got an offer from the NFL, he he was going to leave? Can you come back from that? And the answer is, yeah, he can. Uh, I don't know if that would he happen. can. I don't know if anybody else he can. can. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, in a lot of places, it couldn't happen. In a lot of places, that relationship would be damaged. Uh, you know, the egos in the room, the, the AD would be upset and it would just be, you know, there would now be an expiration date 
on the relationship, but it, that's just not how it works at Michigan. And I, I do give Ward Manuel a lot of the credit for that because Ward Manuel understands what his job is at Michigan. Uh, yeah, you know, he's the adult in the room. He's the decision maker, but he also realizes that part of being the AD at Michigan is being able to take a step back, taking your own ego out of it and saying that if Jim Harbaugh is, is the coach at Michigan, uh, that's, that's better for everybody. And maybe you have to deal with some things. There's always some drama that comes with Jim Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh being your football coach. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, what happened for Michigan was the best outcome that could have happened really, you know, in, in both of these last two off seasons, yeah. uh, you know, the off season before this one, Ward Manuel did kind of a tough thing uh, and brought Jim Harbaugh back when a lot of fans were ready to move on, but brought him back on a contract that made a lot of sense for Michigan. And then this off season, when Jim Harbaugh wanted to explore the NFL, Ward Manuel basically said, hey, do your thing. Check it out. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, come back to me and we'll figure out where to go from there. Uh, I think those were two pretty, pretty shrewd moves by Ward Manuel that ultimately ended up with Michigan in a pretty good place. Yeah. And, and now all they've got to do is beat Ohio state again, which they, you know, <laughs> they've done once since 2012 and figure out how to win the big 10 again. And, and it's interesting because it feels like the big 10 has different dynamics now, not necessarily because of what happened on the field last year, but what happened off the field with contracts, with James Franklin getting most of his contract basically guaranteed at Penn State. So you know what they're going to be. Mel Tucker getting this massive deal at Michigan State. And, you know, this is – so Mel Tucker is now 2-0 and against Jim Harbaugh. That, that, that game, one of the more entertaining games of the season last year, unless you were a Michigan fan. Uh, but I'm fascinated to see, was last year the start of something or was last year – an anomaly. Yeah. I mean, you know, the situation at Michigan state is really fascinating that, that contract for Mel Tucker, you know, completely blew up the market for, for big 10 coaches. And uh, you know, that rivalry with Jim Harbaugh and Mel Tucker is going to be super fascinating moving forward. Uh, you know, we, we kind of know what the Michigan Ohio state rivalry is, Obviously, Jim Harbaugh getting that win against Ryan Day and against Ohio State, you know, that was kind of the breakthrough for Michigan. And I, I think that, you know, breathed some new life into that rivalry just in terms of it, it being competitive and knowing that that Michigan can win that game. Uh, but the, the Ohio State and the Michigan State games for for Jim Harbaugh uh, are going to be really fascinating. And, you know, I think it's notable with Jim Harbaugh's contract, he probably could have walked in there and said, Hey, why am I not getting Mel Tucker money? You yeah. know? Yeah. He's lost to Mel Tucker the first two years. Uh, but if you look at his resume, he's also accomplished a lot. He's more. won the league. He, yeah, he, exactly. he has that now that he can hold. And, and it's, you know, yes, he lost to Ohio state all the other years, but the most recent one they won and, and won decisively. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you can talk about Jim Harbaugh losing five straight against Ohio state, Nobody has a good record against Ohio State in the Big Ten. Uh, you know, very few teams beat Ohio State. So, you know, this is going to be a competitive, uh, a very competitive division moving forward. Uh, and the question is going to be, can Michigan recruit at the level? Uh, can they develop at the level uh, to continue to, to win the Big Ten East? You know, getting that division title was such a huge hurdle that Jim Harbaugh cleared. Uh, I think it put Michigan's program in a, in a different place. Uh, but it's not going to get easier. <laughs> you know, you got to yeah. go to Columbus this year. Uh, Ohio State's going to be out for blood, and and the rest of the division is going to have Michigan circled now. So uh, it's going to be it's going to be tough moving forward. It really is. Well, and and that's the part that that I find interesting because one one thing you guys brought up, uh, Brendan Quinn and Nick Baumgartner, you did a, a podcast that the Beat is the Michigan centric podcast that that Nick and Brendan do, and you came on right after. Harbaugh decided to to come well after the Vikings basically decided Harbaugh was coming back and there was an interesting discussion that you guys had and I think it was Nick who brought this up and he said at what point does Jim Harbaugh become just a guy after this does Jim Harbaugh stop being Jim Harbaugh 
Michigan man, former Michigan quarterback, savior of Michigan football, and become Jim Harbaugh, employee of the University of Michigan, and and then treat it as such if it doesn't go well from here. Yeah, you know, I thought that that, that was one part of this offseason that that could – you know, that could linger, um, that, that could maybe alter the dynamic of, of the relationship moving forward, because there was a thought maybe early on in Jim Harbaugh's tenure that like, if Jim Harbaugh wants something, Michigan's got to give it to him because if not, he's just going to bounce back to the NFL. You know, there was a sense that he was like, you know, the savior who had come back to Michigan after going to the Super Bowl with the 49ers. And, you know, he really was, you know, he, he kind of ran the place. And after this off season, when Jim Harbaugh explored the NFL, made it known that he, he would go if he got the right offer and that offer didn't come. And now he's back. I do think that there's, you know, a little more of like an even playing field now, you know, yeah. where, where Jim Harbaugh is aware that, you know, he still has a lot of power here. He's still Jim Harbaugh, but he also has a boss. You know, he answers to Ward Manuel. Uh, who answers to the board of regents. Like, you know, there, there is a, a power structure here that Jim Harbaugh is a part of, and he's not above it. That, that, and then the other interesting piece of this is his staff, because one of the big reasons for the success last year was getting younger in the coaching staff, bringing in some, some new ideas. Uh, Mike McDonald, the defensive coordinator. Now that always felt to me like the Ravens kind of loaning him out and saying, let's see if you can call plays or not. And, and if you can, you're, you're going right back to the NFL, which is what happened. And then you had Josh Gaddis, the offensive coordinator, leave for Miami. Uh, pretty nasty text message to the players on the, on the way out of town. Not nasty to the players, but nasty toward Michigan on the way out of town. But Sharon Moore is still there, the offensive line coach. Mike Hart is still there, uh, another Michigan man who is, is a rising star in the coaching ranks. Uh, Ron Bellamy, still there, uh, excellent recruiter. They bring in... Uh, mentor who who came from from Vanderbilt and he uh, Jesse Mentor was at Vandy last year, but kind of the same track as Mike McDonald, where he was a, a Ravens assistant. So you get the the John kind of loaning another guy to Jim, uh, and then Matt Weiss also who was with the Ravens, uh, who was coaching quarterbacks for Michigan last year. He's still there as the the co offensive coordinator. So given what they lost, the the two coordinators. How well did they replace them? How seamless is this? Because it feels like offense will be somewhat similar because they've, they've got guys who were helping run it last year. And uh, if you believe the revisionist history when when Josh Gaddis left, who were, were having a pretty heavy hand in running it, and then a new defensive coordinator who basically runs the same defense. Yeah, there was a point during all the NFL drama that, that it was a real worry. Like, is this staff going to just – blow up because a big part of Michigan's success last season was that staff and Jim Harbaugh's decision to get younger, uh, to bring in uh, some guys who played at Michigan, uh, you know, to delegate a little more, to give, give his assistants a little more power to set the direction of the program. That was a big key to the turnaround. And, and one of the fears was, well, is Jim Harbaugh going to lose all these young coaches because his future is, is up in the air. And then is he you know, going to have to bring in like some old Harbaugh guys and is it going to feel like it did before? Um, so to get through that off season, just losing, you know, the two coordinators and, you know, those were big losses, but like you said, McDonald going back to the NFL, not a big surprise. Josh Gaddis leaving, not a huge surprise, even though he was coming off the broils, like there was kind of a sense, maybe yeah. that had run its course a little bit. Uh, Matt Weiss, you know, is somebody who's really kind of, um, you know, solidified himself as like, you know, a guy who's, who's got a lot of pull on that staff. And, and, and Weiss probably goes with Jim if Jim gets the Vikings job, right? Right. That was the speculation, you know, that, that uh, Jim and Matt Weiss were kind of joined at the hip and, you know, him stepping into that offensive coordinator role. Uh, that was kind of expected one way or another. So, um, you know, I, I think they've managed to keep some continuity. You know, they brought in a defensive coordinator who's going to run the same run the same stuff. They have co-offensive coordinators who are going to run the same stuff. Um, so to come out of this, you know, really chaotic offseason with that much continuity, I, I think that was a pretty big win for Michigan. 
So now they have to replace some really good players. I think that's that's a piece of it. You know, we'll, we'll see in the draft where Aiden Hutchinson and, and David Ojabo go. Uh, you wrote a story about Braden McGregor in February. He's supposed to be kind of the next great pass rusher at Michigan. I, I'm curious about this because it, obviously people are going to look at him and say, okay, can you replace Aiden Hutchinson? My, my question, though, is what about replacing Ojabo? Because I feel like the tandem made them so hard to deal with because you now we'll see what poor, poor David Ojabo, you know, tears his Achilles mm-hmm. in his pro day workouts. So we don't know where he's going to get drafted, but would have been drafted fairly high. Like they were a bear to deal with. I, cause you can't slide your protection either direction or away from one. Cause the other one's going to kill you. And so what does Michigan have coming up that can kind of replicate that? Yeah, right now they they really don't have anybody who is as dynamic as either of those two players were. And and that to me is the biggest question with this team is where's the pass rush going to come from? And what we heard through the spring is there's probably not going to be a guy who has, you know, 10, 11, 12 sacks right. on this team. Uh, it's going to have to be a bunch of guys. Uh, you mentioned Braden McGregor. We're still kind of waiting for him to have his breakout moment. He was a top 100 guy from the state of Michigan, had a pretty serious knee injury as a senior in high school. So he's been on a little bit slower track, Uh, but this feels like the time for him to have an opportunity. Mike Morris, they really like, he's a a different type of pass rusher. He's a bigger guy. He's played like every position on the D line, right? Like right. Yeah. You can, yeah, yeah. You can move him all over. Um, You know, Jalen Harrell, um, even when Ajabo was, you know, becoming the player uh, that that he was, you know, a first round type draft pick, um, Jalen Harrell got a lot of snaps on the edge. And I think his his role is going to continue to increase. So, you know, they've got some guys and, you know, they've got some freshmen who look really good, but it's just, you know, they got to kind of get through this transitional period. Uh, and, and figure out who's who's ready to step in into those roles and you know find a you know several guys who can try to pick up what they lost from from those two really good edge rushers other side of the ball it does feel like they can be pretty explosive on offense given what they bring back at receiver I know Ronnie Bell is is recovering still from from his knee injury but he'll be back uh, Andrell Anthony seems like he could be very very exciting based on what we saw you know limited in a limited role last year yeah, you know, if there's one guy on that offense who has the potential to really, you know, to blow up, to really take his game to another level, I, I think it's Andrell Anthony because we saw it basically in one game. In the Michigan, Michigan State, State game, yeah. Game, yeah. Like, you know, everybody's looking at like, who is this guy? His first catch goes 90 yards to the house. Um, you know, he's got some some skills, I think, uh, that – um, separate him from a lot of other receivers. Uh, but he's also in a, you know, in a really crowded room. I mean, Darius Clemens in, you know, freshman in Michigan spring game, uh, you know, made a, you know, a, an amazing catch for a touchdown. There's been a lot of buzz about the freshman wide receivers. So that that's probably the strength of the team right now. Definitely on offense is, is that receiver room because they basically bring everybody back. And they add in some some freshmen who I think are going to be really good. Um, so it does have the potential to be a, a pretty explosive offense, I think. Well, and, and then they've got a transfer from Virginia at center who can just step right in. And I mean, a Remington Trophy finalist who could step right in and, and play right away. I, that that feels like maybe the biggest recruiting pickup of the year. Yeah, definitely. Michigan has not been a team that's used the transfer portal a lot. Um partly because I think it's hard to get into Michigan, uh, maybe partly philosophical. If you graduated from Virginia, you're fine. <laughs> but, but yes, a grad transfer from Virginia, uh, Olu Olu Watimi, who can step in and like start from day one at center. Like that was, you know, if there was like one big hole they had on offense, that was probably it because yeah. they lost Andrew Vistardis, who was such a key part of that offensive line that won the Joe Moore Award. So to bring in a you know an experienced center, um, everybody says he's a really smart guy. knew knew all the calls even before spring ball started. Um, you know, I, I think I don't want to say an upgrade necessarily because we still got to see him on the field. Um, but certainly somebody who's capable of right. doing all even, the stuff. Even if they get the same, they're in really good yeah. shape because that was mm-hmm. a very good offensive line last year. So yeah, that and and, and so. Mm-hmm. 
it's it's really a matter of of who he's snapping to. And if you if you listen to this podcast, you hear Ari Wasserman frequently saying, "Well, when is Michigan going to switch to JJ McCarthy full time?" JJ McCarthy, lingering arm soreness, did not throw very much at all this spring. Didn't really do much at, at all, you know, in terms of a team uh, playing on the field. It's Cade McNamara's team, is it not? It is, yeah. Uh, and Cade basically said that after the spring game. You know, he he basically said, you know, as the top dog on this team, I feel like part of my role is to you know instill leadership in other guys. Like you know, Cade McNamara is very much embracing that uh, mantle as the leader of this offense, and he should. He was the starter for a team that won the Big Ten went to the playoff, went to the Orange Bowl. Uh, If I was Cade McNamara, I'd be saying the same thing. You know, the J.J. McCarthy injury, it's, you know, it's unfortunate for J.J., obviously. You know, you'd like to see him out there. Um, That was going to be a really big storyline in the spring was could J.J. McCarthy close the gap with Cade McNamara? And the injury, it, it you really kind of diffused all of that and, or at least pushed it off to, to the fall. You know, maybe that becomes yeah. a story in the fall when, and if JJ McCarthy starts throwing again right now, it's Cade McNamara's team. And, and I don't really think there's any debate about that. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the part that, that I'm interested in. Can they, can they take another step evolution wise offensively with Cade McNamara? Does, is, is he near his ceiling or is there more room above him that he can, he can ascend to here? Yeah, he talked uh, this week about what he's working on in the offseason, wants to clean up some footwork, some mechanics, uh, and, and maybe that can help him, you know, connect on some of those uh, explosive plays that you saw that were there for Michigan that just didn't happen uh, last season. There is another level that this yeah. offense could hit. Well, uh, and that's, they, that, that's what I'm wondering because, I mean, there was a role for McCarthy. Mm-hmm. And I go back to the, the Michigan State game that the throw he makes, I think it was to, to Andrew Anthony, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. that, that I don't know that Cade McNamara makes or can make. Mm-hmm. And so that's the part. And, and that's why it already keeps coming back to on that is, is the ceiling piece of it. But we just watched Stetson Bennett take a team to a national title. He was not the five star guy in his team. You know, uh, Cade McNamara feels like he has a pretty similar skill set. You know, it seems like he's good enough to get them where they want to go. Yeah, you know, Cade is not as mobile as Stetson Bennett and um you know probably doesn't have the team I mean, definitely doesn't have the team around him. Doesn't right, doesn't have the the, the <laughs> other people to yeah. to help him as as we learned in the in the Orange Bowl. But yeah. but he's got but a good team around him. You know, he's yeah. got Donovan Edwards, he's got Blake he's got, the, he's got the faith of that team too. I think, mm-hmm. I, I think that that's the part Ari sometimes misses when we talk quarterbacks is a lot of times there's a reason a guy wins a starting job and doesn't let it go. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it isn't so much him as how people respond to him. Yeah. And it feels like Michigan responds well to Cade McNamara. Yeah. And if you know anything about Jim Harbaugh, that stuff matters at Michigan. Yeah. Maybe some other coaches would look at it differently. Maybe some other coaches would say, oh, we got this five-star quarterback. We got to play him or we won't get another one. Not how Jim Harbaugh thinks. You know, Jim Harbaugh is totally you – know, he was a quarterback. Yeah. And he was, he was that guy, you know, that, who could, like, rally the team, you know, the emotional leader of the team. You know, Jim Harbaugh totally you know, buys into all of that, and that's part of why Jim Harbaugh loves Cade McNamara and – you know, if J.J. McCarthy's healthy, there's definitely a role for J.J. Yeah. McCarthy. It was notable in the Orange Bowl which quarterback was out there for most of the second half. You know, they thought J.J. gave him the gave best him chance, chance to win against Georgia. So there's a role for J.J. if he's healthy. But I don't think that role is is going to be the starting quarterback unless, you know, something happens to change the dynamic. How much did that Georgia game – kind of settle on the program because they finally overcome Ohio state. Ohio state is a, a program that, that fields a roster that looks like Georgia's a lot of years now, maybe not quite as dominant on defense as that Georgia team was. Cause not many people have been able to do that in the past 20 years to come up with a roster like that, but that's what they have to overcome 
in their own division. And then once they get past it, they've got to figure out a way to overcome that in the playoff. Did that factor into Jim Harbaugh's thinking of this is my best window to get back to the NFL because I don't know if I can make this team into that. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, it really is. And I'd like to, you know, be in, be inside Jim Harbaugh's mind for a, oh, yeah. Yeah. For I, a I realize I'm asking you to crawl into a very, very interesting place. <laughs> exactly. So. Um, you know, I, I tend to believe what Jim Harbaugh said in terms of, you know, he signed a seven year contract when he came to Michigan, his seven years were up losing that Super Bowl had always kind of eaten at him. He yeah, you lost to your brother. You were, you were this close, just this close. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. Um, you know, and he'd finally cleared that hurdle with Ohio state. I think, you know, and talking about things that would have eaten at him to leave Michigan without ever beating Ohio right. state was something. And he this would have been the perfect time to walk out. You're the conquering mm -hmm. hero. You put the program where it needs to be. You don't actually have to beat Ohio state again. Right. Which by the way, I think Jim Harbaugh, more than anyone else, understands how hard that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And remember, Jim Harbaugh idolizes Bo Schembechler. Bo Schembechler never won a national championship. Uh, Big Ten titles really matter at yeah. Michigan. And I think that I think that a lot of Michigan fans uh, have kind of come around to thinking that way, too, where it's like if we beat Ohio State and we win the Big Ten, that's a successful season. Yeah. And the SEC, you know, they play a different game. Like it's a different but talent see, I level. I don't think that's true. Given given what the Big Ten rakes in financially, the Big Ten, the best of the Big Ten should be able to compete with the best of the SEC on an annual basis. Like that the Georgia defense last year was a bit of an anomaly in that. There's rarely anything that good, although I, I say that in the Alabama offense the year before was kind of like that too. But the if you can beat Ohio State, you should be able to compete with the best of the SEC as well. Like I, I, I firmly believe that. Yeah, in theory. Yeah, I mean, that Ohio State team last year, Michigan, if, you know, if you talk to, to people in Michigan, they, they would say, we went into that Ohio State game last year feeling like we could bully them. Yeah, Michigan was very yes. strong where Ohio State was weak mm -hmm. last year. Yeah. That is not going to happen most years. Ohio State, you saw, worked very hard in the offseason to try to shore up the, the problems that it had defensively uh, and brought in Jim Knowles. And, mm -hmm. and we'll see how much of a difference that makes. My guess is, is, is quite a difference because there's – there's a lot of raw material for Jim Knowles to work with, but yeah. no, I, I, that's the part I, I, I just wonder because I look at Michigan beating them, getting, getting over that hump. Finally, we we've seen Penn state put some teams together that were, were very competitive. Mel Tucker who worked for Nick Saban and who worked for Kirby smart knows exactly what the roster has to look like to make this work and is trying to create that roster in East Lansing. So I do think, the, the the competition at the top of the Big Ten is about to get even tougher, but that may actually produce Big Ten champions who are very capable of dealing with anybody else they see in the postseason. Yeah, I mean, whoever comes out of the Big Ten is definitely definitely battle tested. Um, you know, I guess channeling Ari a little bit here, like if you look at the way Michigan has been recruiting, uh, you know, Penn State, Michigan State. Michigan gets some guys. You know, yeah. Will Johnson is a dude, five-star cornerback. Um, but I they mean, don't probably get as gonna, many. They, they probably produced the number one pick in this year's draft. We'll see what the Jaguars do. But Aiden mm -hmm. Hutchins is going top five, and he's yeah. probably going number one. Yeah, I mean that's how it's got to be at Michigan. Michigan is not going to sign, you know, twelve top one hundred players uh, in a class. And you know, we can definitely debate should Michigan be able to do that with the resources they have and the tradition. Well, it, and, and in the NIL era, when when there's no, you know, basically accusation of cheating, if you do it, like you can just go do it if you want to do it now. Yeah, that that's the part I'm I'm curious about with with Michigan folks because they've always sort of kind of stuck their noses up at everybody else. Oh well, we don't do that. Well, there's no do that. Everybody should do that. You are you are just 
taking part in in the American economic experiment at this point. So just do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you talk to, to people at Michigan, um, their take on that would be a lot of these schools in the SEC, uh, as has been publicly stated, I believe, uh, they've been doing this for a long time. Right. Whether it was structures in place, it's just yes. now being brought above the surface. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and I am not so naive uh, to think that it, you know, that type of thing could never happen at Michigan or it never has happened at Michigan. It's uh, never happened in the Big Ten. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Terrell Pryor didn't drive lots of different, uh, different, and I realize that's not at Michigan, but. You know, he had, he, had, he had a couple fresh rides when he was at Ohio State. It's, it's yeah. amazing how that happened. It's right. Um, but if it, if the question is, like, does Michigan have that same infrastructure to be able to just, you know, do that immediately at the level of, of some other schools? No, I don't. Yeah. I don't think so. I think they're working on it. Uh, they've got some things going. Um, but right now, it, it hasn't been just like push a button and all of a sudden yeah. you've got the NIL money. I think that's, money that's pretty common. That's pretty common around the country. There's There's not a lot of places that – that just sort of flip. And even in the SEC, there's some places that, that have been recruiting at an elite level that couldn't just flip the switch as fast as some of the other ones. So mm -hmm. it's it, it will be interesting to see how, how all of that changes because Michigan, when you think about it, has all of the stuff around it where if it is a, you know, everybody's doing this, everybody's allowed to do this, they should be able to take advantage. Yeah. I mean, they've got a lot to sell. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea of like, you know, this massive alumni base, I mean, you know, people who have a lot of money, mm -hmm. uh, who care about Michigan and root for Michigan, like basically you just have to like make that connection where, yeah, how do you, it's, yeah. It's my, uh, it's my, my thing that bothers me about, it's not just Michigan. It's basically a lot of the, the, the higher level academic schools, in the ACC and the Big Ten, and Ohio State, like, and I realize Michigan's can say, well, you know, we're ranked higher academically than Ohio State, but Ohio State understands that you can have a kick-ass hospital and a kick-ass football team. Like mm -hmm. Michigan can too. Yeah. There's no reason they can't, and especially now. Before, if you felt like there was some sort of moral problem with 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 that stuff, then yeah, okay, I get it. But now you can have all of it, so. Yeah. I, I would be fascinated to watch how this goes because there's so Austin, you're going to golly, you're going to be busy over the next few years because <laughs> there's so many variables at play here. Like can Harbaugh keep this up? If he can't, does he not get any, you know, Jim Harbaugh, Michigan legend benefit of the doubt anymore? Uh, or if he can keep this up, do they then ascend to that next level where they're, they are competing with the Alabamas and the Georgias and the, I, I can't wait. This is going to be, a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, I, it's a it's a fascinating place. I mean, it, it's to me, it's one of the really fascinating places in college sports because things are. I mean, it, it does feel like this is a moment for Michigan uh, where really anything is possible. Uh, is it possible that Jim Harbaugh can take Michigan to another level where you know, Michigan is doing what Ohio State has has done? Um, I think that that's possible. Uh, could Michigan go back to being sort of the, you know, the nine or 10 win team uh, that, you know, beats the bad teams in the big 10, but has trouble competing against the best teams. I think that's possible. Um, yeah. I, th I really think that this, this could go, uh, could, could really go anywhere. This the last season for Michigan, you know, it had started to feel kind of stale. Like we yep. see the same thing every year from Michigan and this last season just completely like expanded the horizons of, of what's possible. That's right. The, the limit does not exist. Mm -hmm. They just got to figure that out. Austin Meek, thank you so much. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.